Thanks for joining us this Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. From New York to the Middle East in Washington, we have teams standing by to cover both of these major stories. We begin with the latest on Iran's weekend aerial assault on Israel with NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobiea in London and NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Good morning to both of you. So, Monica, an official told NBC News that the U.S. is not going to take part in an offensive counterattack against Iran and that President Biden is urging Prime Minister Netanyahu to not retaliate. Has the administration said whether it plans to take any other action against Iran for this weekend's attack? Main topic of conversation between the president and Prime Minister Netanyahu in their phone call on Saturday evening. And he conveyed to him that the U.S. would not be part of any kind of retaliatory action or counteroffensive. And he really stressed the prime minister and Israel overall to think carefully and critically about how to respond here because something really could lead to a wider escalation. It could really broaden this conflict that's already so fragile and so fraught. So we know that the U.S., because it met with other G7 leaders, did hint in their joint statement that if they deem there are more moves that are destabilizing to the entire region, that there could be future actions here, but maybe they would be more economic, something like sanctions, if they determine that that's appropriate. But they didn't want to preview any other kinds of moves or any other kinds of responses. And really, the president spent much of the weekend huddling with his national security team and applauding Israel's defense capability and also, of course, the role that the the U.S. played in that, which was to shoot down dozens of missiles and drones that came from Iran, but also from Syria and Yemen. So yesterday, he actually called some of those who were part of those fighter squadrons to commend them for their airmanship and their skill. So everybody was breathing a bit of a collective sigh of relief that the attack to Israel wasn't worse. But of course, everybody's still bracing for what could come next. And the president and his top aides, their main message was, we do not want this to become a wider war. Joe and Savannah. Kelly, let's talk about what we know at this point for Israel's side of things. So despite this warning from President Biden, an Israeli official did tell NBC News that Israel will respond to Iran's attack and that their war cabinet is going to meet today. They met over the weekend also to discuss options. What do we know at this point about their plans? Do we have any idea? what a response could look like. Yeah, Savannah, Israel's war cabinet is set to meet again at this hour after convening for hours last night. An Israeli official told NBC News that the country will respond, as you mentioned, but that no final decision has been made on the scale or timing of that response. The official said that among the considerations were whether Israel needed to retaliate immediately or could wait and what impact any escalation against Iran would have on the military operation in Gaza. We also heard from IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari on Sunday. He said that operational plans for both offensive and defensive actions have been approved, but he didn't get into details on what those operations might be. And again, it's up to the war cabinet to decide if anything will happen at all. A second Israeli aide to a member of the war cabinet told NBC News that no one wants to see an escalation. And it's a very delicate time right now, which I think has been underscored by a number of leaders in the region. Iran has doubled down on its right to defend itself on carrying out these strikes, calling the strikes necessary and, and proportionate. Uh, after that April 1st bombing of the site in Damascus, Iranian officials also said on X that Iran considered the matter concluded after those strikes over the weekend, but warned that if Israel makes, quote, another mistake, Iran would deliver a considerably more severe response. So the back and forth continuing and everyone now waiting on Israel to see whether or not they will respond. Savannah so Monica, Joe. with all that in mind, just how worried is the White House that Israel's response could trigger a wider war in that region? It is a top concern. All weekend long, U.S. officials were huddling. They were trying to talk to their counterparts, their allies throughout the region. We know President Biden, for instance, also called King Abdullah of Jordan, trying to stress that really, ideally, the temperature is going to come down here so that this doesn't become a far deeper conflict that does, in the U.S. view, have the potential for the U.S. and Washington to be dragged in deeper into this conflict than it already is. And we heard a little bit more from National Security Council spokesman John Kirby about this concern. I'll meet the press yesterday. Listen. 
Whether and how the Israelis will respond, uh, that's going to be up to them. We understand that and respect that. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. And that is something that the president also stressed to the prime minister in this phone call, that U.S. support for Israel is ironclad. And of course, that does come against the backdrop of these questions about whether the U.S. will reconsider its policy in Gaza if Israel doesn't do what the U.S. wants it to do from a humanitarian perspective. But that was a little bit of a secondary priority and concern this weekend compared to the attack we saw over the weekend. Joe and Savannah. Hey, Kelly, Monica had mentioned some of these conversations that the U.S. has been having with leaders in the area. Secretary of State Blinken spoke with leaders from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan about this attack over the weekend. What has the response been to this weekend's developments around the Middle East? Tell us more. Well, yet again, you're hearing this same line. Nobody wants an escalation of this. Secretary Blinken and his Saudi counterpart agreeing they needed a coordinated diplomatic response. Uh, the same message coming from the Egyptian foreign minister, the Egyptians and Jordanians, also talking about the need to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza, so not letting the issue of Gaza uh, slide away amidst all of this. And they said it's important to end the crisis there and find a solution that provides lasting peace for both Israelis and Palestinians, really emphasizing uh, the humanitarian issues uh, in Gaza and that continuing crisis and conflict uh, and, and making sure that that is still front and center along with uh, de-escalating uh, this conflict now between Iran and Israel. All right. Savannah Joe, Kelly Cobier and Monica Alba, thank you both. And let's stay on this. We're now joined by Ambassador Dennis Ross. He's the former special envoy to the Middle East. Ambassador Ross, thank you as always for joining us. Thanks for your time this morning. So how concerned are you that any type of response by Israel could escalate into a regional war? Does, does Benjamin Netanyahu have a fair amount of control about what happens next year? Well, I do think all the decisions that are going to be made are going to be more collective decisions, meaning within the war cabinet. The war cabinet includes the prime minister, the defense minister, uh, and Benny Gantz, uh, who joined the government along with Gadi Eisenkot. Uh, Gantz and Eisenkot are two former chiefs of staff of the Israeli military. And I think you're going to see them have a, a major influence uh, in terms of what is done, meaning I'm not sure the prime minister can make a decision in which they would be opposed to it. Now, having said that, your question was, uh, does that mean there'll be no Israeli response? I believe there will be an Israeli response, but one shouldn't think that an Israeli response is necessarily an overt military attack against targets within Iran. Israel has a lot of different kinds of choices, uh, and, and the fact that the Israelis are putting out, and I hope they stick with this, that they will choose the time, place, and the character of what they do, that will keep the Iranians on edge, which I think the Israelis want to do, number one. Number two, it gives them a lot of flexibility in terms of what they choose to do. For example, what if the Israelis at some point within a week or so were to do a massive cyber attack? They wouldn't necessarily take credit for it, but they could shut down a lot of Iran. That would send a message to the Iranian leadership. You did this, you think it's cost-free. It's not cost-free to you. Uh, there could be other covert kinds of actions. Once again, not necessarily something they take credit for. There have been many attacks the Israelis have conducted in the past within Iran against centrifuge assembly plants and the like, again, that wouldn't necessarily be an overt military response. So there's a range of things that the Israelis could do that still fall in the category of responding, uh, but not necessarily look like a, an overt military attack of the sort that we saw the Iranians carry out, carry out against Israel. So, Ambassador, looking at what happened this last weekend, 99 percent of Iran's attack was shot down. And, and as Kelly reported in a statement, Iran says it now considers the matter concluded. That, that begs the question, what was this? Was this meant to be a symbolic show of force? Is there a way both sides can simply declare victory and move on, or does that seem unlikely? I don't think you can call it simply a symbolic approach, because when you fire 300, uh, over 350 uh, rockets, uh, cruise missiles and drones, uh, and you try to time those so that it is designed to make the Israeli defense against it as complicated as possible, they clearly wanted to have, they want to inflict some cost on Israel. 
Uh, and so I don't think it was purely symbolic. However, the fact that they, uh, in a sense, conveyed that they were going to do something over a period of many days in advance gave the Israelis a, a time to prepare. It also gave us time to prepare. We were, along with, with the British and, and others and some in the region, we were responsible for intercepting about a third of all the, the weapons that were fired against Israel. So it gave us time to position ourselves as well. In effect, what the Iranians were signaling is they were going to do something that was going to impose a price on Israel, but at the same time, they didn't want to turn it into a wider war. And, and in a sense, so it's, it's more than symbolic. It is, it is a statement they wanted to inflict much more damage on Israel without turning it into an all-out war. Um, and they were frustrated in that. Uh, it is interesting. Their claims, by the way, are that they forced Israel to spend a lot of its assets uh, in defense, uh, and that in itself is an achievement. I guess I would make one more point. Mm -hmm. The real point here is that the Iranians have signaled the Israelis that when the Israelis go after their Revolutionary Guard uh, senior generals uh, in Syria, that from now on it's going to draw an Iranian response. In effect, what they're trying to do is change the rules of the game. All right, Ambassador Dennis Ross, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and expertise this morning. Let's turn now to our other top story this morning, the historic start of the criminal trial of former President Donald Trump. Yeah, jury selection begins today in the hush money case brought by Manhattan's district attorney. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records and could face up to four years in state prison. Prosecutors, prosecutors allege this was done to conceal payoffs used to hide damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. The case centers around allegations Trump tried to suppress various sex scandals with hush money, most notably a $130,000 payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels, paid via his former fixer and lawyer Michael Cohen. Now, Trump denies any wrongdoing. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard is outside the courthouse for us this morning. So, Von, history will be made today in that courthouse right behind you when Donald Trump becomes the first former president to stand trial ever in a criminal case. Explain to us the jury selection process, which won't be easy. How is that all expected to unfold? Well, first of all, guys, you're looking at 6,000 New Yorkers who are being summoned this week to the Manhattan criminal court system. That's not all for the Trump trial, but in a typical week, it's 4,000. And a source tells NBC News that that 2,000-person uh, uptick is due to the Trump trial here because of the understanding that you're dealing with a criminal defendant who is so well-known. And just today alone, they're looking at 1,500 jurors coming in, and there's going to be more than six questions that are asked of jurors, including everything from whether they've attended a Trump rally in the past, whether they follow him on social media, or what new sites they read or watch. What is unique about this case is that each of the jurors, they have the opportunity to dismiss themselves for whatever reason, saying they are not able to attend what could be a six-week trial. This is going to be a very serious process where the prosecution and the defense are engaged. You're looking at a total of 12 jurors being selected, as well as six alternates. Von, who are some of the main witnesses expected to testify here? And at this point, do we know if Trump himself will take the stand? Of course, we're looking at Michael Cohen, who is Donald Trump's former personal lawyer. He's the one, Michael Cohen, who paid Stormy Daniels, the porn star, uh, uh, two weeks before the 2016 election, $130,000 to keep her story silent about her alleged affair with Donald Trump. But what gets at the heart of the 34 felony counts is Donald Trump's reimbursement of Michael Cohen throughout 2017 in the form of checks for that $130,000. So we expect to see the prosecution bring not only Michael Cohen, but also of Stormy Daniels, but even individuals like former Trump aide Hope Hicks, who had put Michael Cohen uh, on the phone with uh, David Pecker, the head of AMI, uh, back in 2016. It, 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 of course, Hope Hicks was a longtime loyalist of Donald Trump, and that is what is so compelling here about this case, is that these are events that took place now nearly nine years ago, but only after he was leaving the White House. At this point in time, it was the investigation from the district attorney 
attorney ultimately culminate in these 34 felony counts. So, Von, break down what is really at stake here, both politically and just personally for the former president. Of course, we're less than seven months away here from the general election. And I was at a rally in central Pennsylvania with Donald Trump over the weekend where he repeatedly lambasted the trial against him, saying there's no case against him, that he is innocent. And he made a very clear statement saying that when he goes inside of that courtroom, he knows that, in his words, 200 million Americans are behind him. Donald Trump is looking to not only make the case here to the jury inside the actual courtroom, but also make the case to the American election electorate at large is that he is innocent or at least that he is being unfairly prosecuted. For Donald Trump, there is new polling just from this weekend from New York Times Siena College, though, that showed that a majority of Americans, including a majority of independents who are going to be critical to his ability to win in those major battleground states, view the charges against him here in New York as either very serious or somewhat serious. So for Donald Trump, being able to go onto the campaign trail when he can, because he's required as a criminal defendant to be inside of this court room when he's able to get out on the campaign trail or address microphones he has every intention of trying to undercut the testimony presented against him by people like Michael Cohen but also make the case to the American public at large that he is still the best one fit to be in the White House even if he is found guilty and even sentenced to prison time for 2025. All right Von Hilliard we will be speaking with you a lot over these next several weeks thank you as always. We sure will well, let's stay on this and walk you through the timeline of what we are expecting in this trial. Yeah jury selection kicks off today. That is expected to take one to two weeks. Overall, this trial expected to last six to eight weeks. The court will take some time off. It will not meet on Wednesdays. It will also take days off for Passover, which starts April 22nd. It's expected to wrap up well before the next big political event on the calendar. That is the Republican National Convention, which begins July 15th in Milwaukee. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now to dig in on what we're about to see unfold today, this jury selection process. So as Vaughn had mentioned, 6,000 New Yorkers summoned to come in to potentially serve this week. That's more than normal. Tell us exactly what to expect from them in these next couple days. I expect we're going to burn through a lot of them in mm. jury selection, and that's what the court expects. That's why they summoned so many jurors, because you can expect right off the bat, there are going to be some jurors who will raise their hand and say right up front, I don't think I can consider the evidence in a fair and unbiased way. Because mm. Judge Mershon has pointed out, it's not enough that a juror may not like the defendant. Uh, we're sitting in a county where, statistically, looking at voting returns, a lot of people in Manhattan probably don't like Donald Trump. That's not the inquiry. The inquiry is whether or not they can set aside their biases mm. and listen to the evidence and make a decision based on the evidence and the law. Uh, however... That just may not be possible. Right. And Judge Mershon has said that self-identified jurors who say, hey, I, I'm out, I can't do this, they're not even going to interview them further. So you're going to see a lot of people moving in and then moving out of the courthouse, I think, relatively quickly as they go through jury selection. I did jury duty just last I week. And me I, the week before. Yeah, so. I, but I saw firsthand they were asking for people for like a six-week trial, and it was nearly impossible to get people who could commit to that. And that was without the former president being the defendant in the case. So let's talk about the questions that are going to be asked here. What can be asked of the jurors? And more importantly, perhaps, what can't be asked? Because you can't say, like, who'd you vote for in the last election, right? Notably, that is the question that is omitted from the juror questionnaire. But look, let's get real. Some of the questions in there certainly give you an idea of which way someone's politically leaning. For example, what do you read? Here are some of the other questions. Have you ever been a member of QAnon or Antifa? That might give you a couple ideas mm -hmm. of which way a juror leans politically, but the specific question of who did you vote for isn't in there. On the other hand, did you ever attend a rally for Donald Trump? If you attended a rally for Donald Trump, either you're a journalist or you're a fan of Donald Trump. So these questions, and Judge Mershon himself said, look, we're not asking that voting question, but you're going to be able to tell from the answers to some of these questions which way someone leans. And the bottom line is it really doesn't matter. What really matters is whether or not they think they can set aside whatever thoughts they have about this particular defendant. I th actually think normally in jury duty, uh, the mission is get out of jury duty. I actually think something they need to guard against is the stealth juror, yeah. somebody who's going to pretend to be, oh, I am just vanilla neutral. You can put me on this jury, but they have an agenda. Wow. This is arguably one of the four most important criminal cases in American history. If you're a juror and you are thinking about a book deal or something like that, or you just want to be part of history, this is the place to be right now.
Wow. It's a lot to watch for. Quite a tall order to get this in yeah. line. Danny Savalas, thank you so much. We'll be talking throughout the week. Let's bring in Axios senior politics reporter Eugene Scott for more on the potential fallout of this trial. Eugene, good morning. So a recent New York Times poll showed 58 percent of voters see these charges as very or somewhat serious. I mean, for almost any other politician, a case like this would be fatal. That's not the case for former President Trump. In fact, it's only strengthened his support within his base. Why is that? And what could be the impact on more independent minded voters or swing voters who maybe voted for him once but didn't vote for him another time? Sure. Well, one reason is that the former president has been incredibly effective in communicating to his base uh, that he's being targeted, that this is a witch hunt. And we've seen uh, since he launched his campaign in 2016 that these individuals are incredibly loyal to him and believe what he says very often when he communicates to them what the agenda of the U.S. government is. In terms of swing voters, a group I speak to often through the Axios Swing Voter Project Overwhelmingly, when we talk to people in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, and all these states that will be influential in determining who will win the next presidential election, most of these individuals are not on the Trump train. And they are concerned that the former president's ongoing legal problems, which will continue or could continue, should we say, uh, after the election in November, uh, could make it difficult for him to lead this country. This could be the only trial, right, that actually has a verdict before Election Day this year. The fact that it's this particular one of all uh, of the legal issues the former president is facing, what could any outcome of this trial, guilty, innocent, what could that mean for the election? Well, we know that there have been individuals that we've spoken with who are swing voters who have said that if convicted, they will find themselves much less likely, much less willing to back Donald Trump. And so this could be very instrumental in determining whether or not uh, Donald Trump gets to return to the Oval Office. Once this tri trial begins, Trump is going to be in court most days. That's the expectation. How will this affect his ability to run a successful campaign against President Biden? We know he sort of has turned this into part of the campaign, but there's also no cameras in court. Well, it'll have a significant impact. The reality is it's very difficult to campaign. I mean, it's a full-time job. Uh, and so if he's not even able to attend this job, he's going to have to resort to other options. Some of the options that uh, his campaign have said they'll resort to is leaning heavily on surrogates. Uh, they're going to spend significant time talking to conservative media, knowing that conservative media is quite popular with their base. And they're going to hope that social media uh, is able to communicate to people that they're hoping to reach, including those outside of his base, uh, what it is that he believes he will do if he's able to return to the White House. And hopefully that message will trump whatever's happening in the court. All right. Eugene Scott, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.